the preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Life and on behalf of the 92nd Street Y, I welcome you to this evening's program, Judaism, Science, and God. And, but before we begin, I would like to tell you just about a few of our upcoming events. This Thursday night, February 1st, we welcome Leslie Gelb as, she, as he speaks sorry, on Israel, the U.S., and the state of anti-Semitism. It's going to be a very interesting program. On Friday night, in February 2nd, please join us for our monthly Shabbat Salon. For those of you who don't, are not familiar with our Shabbat Salons, it is an evening, a Friday night evening, a Kabbalat Shabbat with an Oneg Shabbat with drinks and a reception. And every time we have a different guest speaker, this week we have so Siona Benjamin. She's an Indian artist that will talk about, show her work and talk about her journey from east to west. Um, all these and other programs you can find in our catalog, so please pick up a catalog to learn more about these and up and other upcoming 92nd Street program wise. And now I am pleased to introduce our honored guest this evening, Dr. Rabbi Carl Feit. Dr. Feit is a noted cancer research scientist and the occupant of the Dr. Joseph and Rachel Adds Chair in Health Sciences at Yeshiva University, where he serves as the chairperson of the Science Division of Yeshiva College since 1985. Prior to that, he was a research scientist at the Laboratory of Immunodiagnostics at the Sloan Kettering Institute for Cancer Research. Dr. Feit also serves on the editorial board of the Cancer Investigation. He is a Talmudic scholar and has lectured and taught Talmud classes for many years. So without further ado, please join me in, join me in welcoming to the stage Dr. Carl Feit. Thank you, Yaron, and my thanks to the 92nd Street Y uh, for giving me the, the this opportunity to address you tonight, and especially I thank you for coming out on this Sunday night um, to join me in this talk. As uh, Yaron said, um, what I do professionally is um, I'm a biologist. Uh, and I've been doing immunological research relating to cancer research and other things for my entire professional career. Um, I am a professor in the biology department at Yeshiva University. Um, and among other things, I teach the introductory biology class to uh, our freshman students, many of them pre-meds, etc. So the issue of, um, of evolution in Jewish tradition is something that um, is uh, near and dear to my heart and something that I've been dealing with for um, 30 some odd years or so, or probably actually even longer than that. But, um, um, what I would like to do um, is to tell you that the proximate reason for my having been asked to be here tonight um, was that fairly recently a volume came out the University of Chicago Press called Jewish Tradition and the Challenge of Darwinism. Um, this is the results of a conference that took place about three or four years ago at this point, but you know, between the time the conference takes place and the time the book actually gets published, there's a lap of years. So it came out um, in the fall, or in November, I believe, um, and uh, somebody either saw the book or saw my chapter in the book or heard about it and asked me if I would be willing to speak on this topic, uh, 92nd Street Y. I guess they realized they didn't have to fly me in from anywhere, so I was a uh, cheap date, as they say. Um, but I agreed, because uh, I, I enjoy talking about this topic. Um, and although, this, as I said, this is a University of Chicago Press book, um, I get no royalties from the sale or anything like that. Um, but, but the book is available um, at the Barnes & Noble counter right outside of, uh, over here. There's also another book on why the science religion debate matters, um, which is a Templeton University Press book, also uh, came out at the end of 2006, um, on which I have a, a general chapter the, but the, uh, my chapter um, in this book is, uh, is the one that really relates to, to Darwinism, per se. Um, there's another book that I'm going to plug, but I'll tell you about that one in a moment. It's not my book. So I'm looking around, and we have a, a mixed audience. Um, and uh, so for me, um, I'm kind of um, just getting, trying to get a feel um, of who you are and what it is that you're interested in, um, in hearing about. Um, there are a lot of different, uh, uh, different areas of, of, of evolution in Judaism that I could talk about. Um, I have a kind of generic talk that I think will be interesting, including some new material that I really haven't presented before. Uh, but it's a small enough group 
um, that um, I want to encourage you to feel free to ask questions. Um, I, I teach, so I'm used to interacting with, uh, with the audience. I get questions. Um, so you have the right to ask questions, as long as you understand that I have the right to not answer your questions if I choose not to. But, uh, but, but if there's something that's interesting to you that I'm going you know, through quickly, or there's something, that, something I said that didn't make sense, then please you know, stop me, and uh, I'll be glad to try to answer it. So let me start off, in case anybody ends up um, leaving early, you want to know where I'm going to go. Let me start off with um, two quotes um, that I both start the chapter with in this book, and I also um, start the lectures that I give at Yeshiva University with um, these two quotes, and then, I, then we go on beyond that. Um, but these are the two quotes, so there are no secrets as to where we're going. Um, the first is a quote from um, Harav Avram Yitzhak HaKohen Cook. That's, uh, that's, that's Rav Cook. Rav Cook was the first chief rabbi of the state of, of, um, of Eretz Yisrael, Medina Yisrael. Um, and a remarkable, incredible thinker, broad, um, who confronted the uh, modern issues in, 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 a very, uh, in very original and open ways. Um, a great hero um, of mine. Um, and in the Orot HaKodesh, he makes the statement. Uh, I'll read it in English. For those who want to see it in Hebrew, it's up there. Um, and this was written in the 1930s. Okay, so this is uh, going back to a time when evolution wasn't quite the mainstream, even in biology as it is today. But anyway, evolutionary theory, which is now achieving such worldwide acclaim, coincides with the lofty doctrines of Kabbalah more than any other philosophical doctrine. That's quote number one. Quote number two. This is from Rabbi Yosh, uh, Joseph B. Soloveitchik, or Yosheb Ber Soloveitchik, um, uh, the, the great icon of modern orthodoxy in the United States, 20th century, the dominant thinker, the dominant personality, um, Rosh HaYeshiva at uh, Yeshiva University, um, and I was privileged to be a student of his as well. So this is taken from one of his most famous essays, The Lonely Man of Faith, page 7. I've never been seriously troubled by the problem of the biblical doctrine of creation, vis-a-vis -vis the scientific doctrine of creation at both the cosmic and organic levels. Um, so that's um, Rub speak. He uses, uh, he tends to use um, uh, locutions that some people find difficult. Um, basically what he says is, uh, neither cosmology, the history of the long history of the universe that we study about in physics, nor evolution that we study about in biology have ever really been presented serious problems to him. Um, okay. Um, that being the case, um, you know, we could all go home. All right, there are no problems. Okay, so we'll go home. Um, clearly, um, it, there are major issues between people of religious persuasion and others um, with the Darwin's theory of evolution. Uh, I want to focus a little bit on the history of this conflict um, in the United States. Um, talking about the history, if you know anything about evolution, you know the evolution claims that you can't understand the current status of anything if you don't understand its history. I'm not a historian, but I think it's the same thing is true. If you want to understand the current situation, whether it's, a, whether it's an argument or a machlokus in society, it's very good to understand the history of these things. So, um, of course, in 1925, there was a famous trial held in Tennessee. It's called the Scopes Trial, also known as the Monkey Trial. Um, and it was, um, it, it, it was seared, I guess, into the popular mind. Um, there was a, a, a play that was written called Inherit the Wind, um, which played on Broadway and became a, uh, was made into a movie. Spencer Tracy was the star. He played the Clarence Darrow part. But the, the, the play is a fictionalized version of the Scopes trial that took place in Tennessee in 1925 when a um, young professor, of bio, uh, not professor, a young teacher of biology in the high school um, had the audacity, uh, his name was uh, Scopes, had, uh, Robert Scopes, who had the audacity to um, teach evolutionary theory in his biology class. Um, so he was um, immediately put on trial. Um, and there were two major figures, both of whom were very prominent um, in the United States. One is Clarence Darrow, um, and the other is William Jennings Bryant, a uh, candidate for president multiple times, a uh, great believer in the gold standard. Um, uh, and, the, uh, and so this little trial, the trial in, in Tennessee, Dayton, Tennessee, um, kind of uh, in the backwaters of the United States, but it became very important and very public in all of the newspapers and all of the, uh, the, the mass media that they had at the time, it was 1925, um, kind of descended upon Dayton, um, uh, Tennessee, in order to, um, to, to look at this trial. 
Um, I have this picture up here because, again, it's something that's important in, in the field that is important to me. I always knew about the Scopes trial. I actually read a lot of the actual trial itself, as well as when I was young. I saw, uh, you know, I, I saw Inherit the Wind, uh, both on Broadway, I saw the, and, uh, and saw the uh, play uh, and the movie that went with it. Um, but in 2005, in the Smithsonian Institute, um, they actually discovered an archive, and they had actual photographs that, had, that people didn't know were there um, of, the, of the trial in 1925, and these were just released in 2005. So this was in the New York Times uh, on the 1925 Evolution Trial History. So um, I, I always felt that in the uh, Inherit the Wind, if you remember, um, they made a big deal about how public the trial was and people were coming from all over, and then I thought, I thought that was the artistic license. But in point of fact, if you see over here, the trial was held outside because there wasn't enough room in the courtroom. And in fact, if you look around at the crowds of people, this was a major, major public event. It was a national event that took place. Um, and, these, uh, and again, you have the two, um, the, the two main protagonists over here. Um, this is Williams Jennings Bryant, who's protecting the Bible, the religious approach that says that evolution has to be forbidden and can't be taught in the schools because it's contradictory to scriptures. And you have, the, you have Clarence Darrow up here who's cross-examining him. William Jennings Bryan went on the stand as, as the, the Bible expert, not just that he was the prosecutor, but he was the Bible expert as well. Um, so that was 1925, okay, um, in Tennessee. Um, those of you who read the book saw the movie. So the bottom line is that, that Scopes, the professor, the biology teacher, lost, and the evolution lost in American education. Um, he was found guilty. Uh, eventually, the, the sentence, he was sentenced to a year in jail. That was appealed. He never really spent very much time in jail, but that was, it, was, it was symbolic. All right, so even though Spencer Tracy, playing the, uh, Williams, the, uh, uh, playing the hero in the movie, did his best, but, uh, but, the, but he lost. Um, so it was a loss not only for him, but it was really it was a loss for evolution. Um, so note the dates. Okay, so that was 1925. Now you have to understand, so in the United States, between 1925, um, and certainly through the 1950s, um, evolution was not really taught in public schools. Um, the people who write textbooks want to be able to sell their textbooks nationally, and that means that they don't want them bought just in New York and Connecticut and Massachusetts. They want them to sell in Arkansas and Tennessee and, and Texas as well. And so they wrote biology textbooks that largely ignored um, evolutionary theory, although evolutionary theory was the heart. It was the theory of biology, but they were just left out of textbooks. Uh, for practical reasons, okay? Up until, all right, a famous Supreme Court decision, Epperson versus Arkansas, 1968. Again, you have to look at the date. Why is 1968 significant? I will tell you why it's significant. 1957, in 1957, um, what we used to call the Soviet Union um, launched a satellite into space. It was called Sputnik. And we entered into what we called the space race, but it was really an education race. We were in the middle of the Cold War. Um, the Russians beat us into space, and there was this panic in the United States that our students here were not being given the kind of scientific education um, that would allow us, the Western world, to be able to compete with what was going on in Russia. So it wasn't until 1957 that um, there was enough of a movement that said, you know, we really have to go back and we have to teach science in a modern way. And they went back and there were various groups of educators who looked at the, at the biology textbooks that were being used in high school, they realized they were out of date in multiple ways. They were not molecular. They hadn't really seen the molecular revolution that had taken place already after uh, starting in 1950. They were not up to date. And of course, they left that evolution. So new biology textbooks were written that included molecular biology and evolution in them. That was beginning in the late 1950s, okay, going into the 1960s. Um, those who were still opposed to teaching evolution for religious reasons um, counteracted. Um, see, Epperson said, right, that Arkansas's law prohibiting the teaching of evolution was unconstitutional because the motivation based it upon it was a literal reading of Genesis. What's the problem with evolution? It contradicts the literal reading of Genesis 1, um, and therefore it's anti-religion. It's against religion, and religion wins. So um, by 1968, the Supreme Court was able to say, I'm sorry that, the, that this is science, and in the science room, science wins. So you can't use religious arguments to, uh, uh, to close out science debates. Since the motivation was based on, on Genesis, then, which is religion, 
establishment clause prevents us from using religion um, and making decisions about what gets taught in science, and so that was left out. So that was 1968. The, um, those who were opposed to teaching evolution um, did not give up, however, at that point. Um, and so they, they developed a strategy that said that, um, obviously, okay, so we can't compete um, on the basis of saying that evolution is anti-Christian and so therefore anti-religious and therefore that's no good. So what we're going to do is we're going to create an alternative science. And we're going to call it creation science or creationism. Um, and it's going to be what we call science, but it's going to be a science that is in conformity with the literal reading of Genesis 1. Okay, so that's who creationists are. So, um, and they still exist, and I took this, this from a, a number of years ago. They even have theme parks uh, based on creationists where, where children don't have to see dinosaurs and things like that, that God forbid would then have to be explained as to where they came from. Um, this was all this is 19, 2004, so not that long ago. Um, so what is creationism or creation science? So in modern usage, creationism has come to, mean a strong, uh, to be most strongly associated with a, band of, with a brand of Christian fundamentalism in which the books of Genesis are held to provide absolute truths about the creation of kinds of life and often, in more literal face, the age of the universe and the age of the earth. It therefore conflicts with the more allegorical theological interpretations of the mainstream churches. Creationism typically connotes a religious, political, and social campaign for instance, in education, to assert the dominance or widespread acceptance of a spiritual view of nature and of humanity's place in it, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So, um, again, so what they did is they gave themselves a new name. Right? Instead of being religious fundamentalists, we're now creation scientists. And they claimed that there was science that competed with that. Um, and and uh, that there was, uh, it was an alternative way of doing science. Those who hold strict creationist views reject scientific theories that contradict their understanding of the religious text. Most notable is the rejection of the scientific consensus on evolution, common descent by most creationists. They often also reject the scientific consensus regarding the geological history of the Earth, what we call the deep history of the Earth and the solar system and the galaxies that we live in, the formation of the solar system and the origin of the universe. Okay, so... Um, all right, so between 1960, so after 1968, they derived this new strategy, and they said, fine, we're not, we're not asking that Christianity be taught in the schools. They know they lost, the courts threw them out on that one. So, but why can't creation science be taught along with the materialistic science that you're teaching our students anyway? Um, and they tried to, on a state level, they were successful until the courts, until it was, it was appealed on the state level in, so, in several southern states, in western states, and went up to the Supreme Court. The famous McLean versus Arkansas in 1981. So that was what was happening between 1968 and 1981. There was a reaction to the fact that you couldn't teach science, you couldn't use science to close it out, so you invented this thing called creation science um, and until 1981. So in 1981, a federal judge found that the Arkansas balanced treatment law, that meant it's fine, you want to teach evolution, that's really fine, but you have to teach creation science, i.e. Genesis, written as science, along with what I'll call real science, but that's my prejudice. Okay, but the, so the board of the uh, McLean versus Arkansas, the Supreme Court says that the balanced treatment law mandating equal treatment of creation science with evolution is unconstitutional because creation science is not science and you can't mandate that it's religion again. Religion in sheep's clothing, wolf's clothing, um, and you can't teach it. Um, 1987, they continued to struggle. 7-2 court decision against Supreme Court. Court invalidated Louisiana's Creationism Act because it violated the Establishment Clause. Uh, again, the idea was that, that educational, that the federal government doesn't really legislate um, curriculum states do, so they kept working at a state level to try to write into the state constitutions what could get taught in school. Um, but again, you always have, people have the right to appeal state laws, so they had a Creationism Act that said the creation had to be taught in school, and that was found illegal. 1990, the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals um, ruled that school boards have the right to prohibit teaching creationism because such lessons would constitute religious advocacy. So you could actually prohibit it. Not only that you, nobody could force you to do it, but you could say, no, we're not even going to mention it at all, and that was a right that any school board had. Peloza um, decision, 1994, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals decision, teachers does not have a right to teach creationism in a biology class, that evolutionism is not a religion or worldview, and that the government can restrict the speech of employees while they're on the job. So, in other words, there was a, there was a teacher who was a fundamentalist and who insisted that he had his his rights were being impinged upon if he couldn't teach his creation science to his students in opposition to evolutionism. Uh, words are important, right? How you make 
how you make, make uh, how you form words. Evolutionism, right, is a religion, you know. Like Judaism is a religion. Evolutionism is a religion. So why can't I teach my creationism along with the other isms that are being taught in the scientific cl- in the science class? The Supreme Court said that's not that's not the case, and and it's not restricting your freedom of speech because in fact you're employed by the government and you don't have total freedom of speech to say whatever you want while you're being paid by the taxpayer's money. Um, Freyla was a Fifth Court Circuit uh, of Appeals decision that found that a disclaimer to be read before teaching about evolution ultimately had the effect of furthering religious interest and was therefore unconstitutional. So what they finally said, so then, they, then in, by the 1999 this is, so what they said was, okay, fine, we can't get you to stop teaching evolution, this wicked thing in school. But you know what we're going to do? You know, since 1960-something, when you buy a pack of cigarettes, what does it have on it? Warning label, right, warning label. The, the, uh, uh, right? is hazardous to, you, to your health, okay? So what they did is they said, that's fine. We'll allow you to teach your evolutionism in our schools, but every textbook has to have a warning label on it. Right? A war- true. This was true. Um, a warning label that said, um, evolution is just a theory. It's a theory that some people have, and we might include it in some of the books that we read, but everybody should remember, this is just some few people's ideas, right? Not necessarily true. And thousands of, hundreds of thousands of textbooks were printed with these disclaimers on them. I have a few copies that I've saved for historical interest in my, in my office. Um, and uh, furthermore, then in 2001, um, they actually said that you can remove a teacher um, who insists on asserting his rights. Federal uh, District Court finds that a school may remove a teacher from teaching a biology class when that teacher, a creationist, cannot adequately teach evolution. Even if he doesn't even if he's not teaching his creationism, if he refuses to teach the biological theories that are part of, you know, that, that, are, that are part of the stock of the biology, he says, I'll teach you everything but evolution, I'm sorry, then you're not a competent biology teacher anymore and you can lose your job. Okay, so that gets us, so that's what, that's what was going on in the 1990s. Now, the, those who had started the, the creation science movement again, were searching for ways in which they would be able to get their agenda across. So they realized you couldn't do it if you called it religion. Creation science, that word, creationism and creation science, were already recognized by the court as just being disguise words for religion. So they had to have another disguise in which to dress this up in. So they invented something called intelligent design. Um, And so from the mid-1990s through today, the debate in the United States is why can't we teach intelligent design along with the standard way of teaching evolution? So again, I show you my prejudices, but this is a cartoon that I find. You know, is there an argument of intelligent design? It has a mathematical proof of something, and, you know, and then in the middle, then a miracle occurs. Okay. So the question is, does that ever constitute science or, or, or is that allowed in science and mathematics that we, you know, things work up to here and then you must accept that a miracle occurs in order to get from here to there, all right? Um, so that's a caricature of intelligent design, but I have to tell you, not all that much of a caricature. Okay, so again, here, and I, I take these definitions, these are not, I don't make these up, but just pull, you just pull them off, you Google the word and pull it off the web. So intelligent design is a concept that certain, fe- so again, they have to attack the standard format of teaching evolution, the, st- the standard science of evolution. Um, and so what they say is that certain features of the universe and of living things are best explained by an intelligent cause, not an undirected process such as natural selection which is what evolution says. Its leading proponents, all of whom are affiliated with the Discovery Institute, say that intelligent design is a scientific theory that stands on equal footing with or is superior to current scientific theories regarding the origin of life. So I have to tell you that these guys at the Discovery Institute are very clever. Um, I have some material on who they are and what they do, but I think it's not really, that's not really important. What I think is important is for us to think about how successful they've been. They have been incredibly successful because they have... Um, a number of people who they are funding. Um, let me just get some of the names up here. Um, and I'll come back. Um, so one of the early beneficiaries of Discovery Largesse was William A. Dembski. Again, somebody, anybody who reads uh, about intelligent design, he's a major proponent of, of, uh, of intelligent design. You know, so they have uh, they've recruited people to um, propose this counter theory 
to material, some what they call material science, as an alternative. And there are a number of, they devised a strategy. They, just, they, uh, they devised a strategy, uh, which I have it up here somewhere. It's called, well, where is it? All right, called the, the wedge strategy. And again, you can, you can go online, you Google them, go online, look them up, and they tell you exactly what their motivations are and what they are doing. Okay, their strategy uh, is as follows. The Institute's primary thrust in terms of funding and resources uh, dedicated are those in political and cultural campaigns centering around intelligent design theory. And these include what they call the wedge strategy. Now, the wedge strategy says that if we could just show that evolution is not good science, that there's something wrong, there's an essential flaw in evolution, so then what we will do is we will be able to knock the whole apple cart over. Because if evolution is flawed, then you cast dispersions on the whole scientific enterprise as being flawed. And once we get that wedge in, we will be able to insert our values rather than the secular values of science. Okay, so that's the wedge strategy, and they divide this intelligent design movement in which they have people who claim that if you look at the world, right, and you see how complex it is, and you really are at difficult odds to try to explain how things got to be the way they are, that it's a far simpler answer to say it was designed by an intelligent designer than to say that evolution, working through natural laws over periods of millions of years, was able to produce this. That's their argument. It's a simpler, cleaner argument. That's the intelligent design movement. And then what they say is that obviously at the, at the outset, we are not going to be able to knock evolution out of the picture. But all we're doing in the great American tradition is saying, just at least teach the controversy. Right? You claim to be scientists, and you claim to be open-minded, and you're the liberals, and you're the ones that are so open to everything that goes on. Right? So all we're asking you is, if there's great controversy in the scientific field of evolution, teach our students the controversy. Teach them about intelligent design, along with your non-intelligent design type of evolution. That was their strategy. Okay? So the movement strategy set forth by Johnson, he's the head of this institute, states the replace, what they're aiming for is the replacement of materialist science, that's their term, with theistic science as its primary goal. And more generally, for intelligent design to become the dominant perspective in science and to permeate our religious, cultural, and moral, and political life. The agenda is now being actively pursued by the Center for Science and Culture, which plays the leading role in the promotion of intelligent design. Its fellows include most of the leading, uh, leading intelligent design advocates. And again, if you read the literature, you'll see it's William Dembski, Michael Behe, a biochemist, Jonathan Wells, Stephen C. Myers, who write these things. But they've been incredibly successful. Right? They've been so successful because Americans love the idea of fair play. So most Americans are not really very up on the latest issues of science. Science is kind of, you know, very technical, and you have to, all right, you know, it's all very detailed. And if there are these intelligent people who say that there's a flaw in it, I mean, that sounds reasonable, right? So why not let's teach the controversy? Isn't that a good thing? Don't we want to stimulate our students, teach them that there's a lot of argument and debate going on in the world of science about whether or not evolution is or was or... Uh, you know, is the best theory to explain these things. So that's a good, and, th and so their cause has been taken up then by people who are not themselves intelligent design strategists, who are not themselves fundamentalist Christians who have an agenda, but isn't it fair? Let's just, let's just teach intelligent design. What, what's the downside to it? So again, as I, say, I marvel at how successful they've been. Um, okay, so intelligent design presents an alternative to purely naturalistic explanations for evolution. Right? So it's an alternative to naturalist explanations. Okay, well, but what science does is look for naturalistic explanations. Okay, we'll come back to that. The state of purpose to investigate whether or not existing empirical evidence implies that life on Earth must have been designed by an intelligent agent or agents. William Dembski, one of the intelligent design's leading proponents, has stated that the fundamental claim of intelligent design is that, quote, there are natural systems that cannot be adequately explained in terms of undirected natural forces and that exhibit features which, in any other circumstances, we would attribute to intelligence. Okay, now, to put this in a context, um, anybody who knows anything about the history of Western philosophy and theology, you know that um, since the Middle Ages, 
probably earlier, but it's definitely since the Middle Ages, um, there has been, um, in theology, an argument for the existence of God called the argument from design. Um, it's very clearly stated in Aquinas, Maimonides, and the Jewish view discusses the same argument. The argument is, you look at the universe, and you see the way you look at the world, look around the world around, you see how nicely everything fits, how everything works together. Uh, if you pick up, if you find something in the house that works, and a piece of machinery that works, you know, somebody must have planned it. So if you look at the universe, and you see the way, everything very complicated, but everything fits together and works very nicely, so therefore somebody must have planned it, and it's, a, it's one of the classical arguments, one of the five classical medieval arguments, the argument of teleology, or the argument from design, or the argument to design. Okay, um, and so it has, a, it has a, 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 an ancient and hoary history um, in, in Western thought. Um, the problem is that in the 1700s, um, David Hume, the great philosopher, the great skeptic philosopher, showed the flaw in the argument, and basically nobody has refuted. It's a flawed argument because it's an argument of analogy in which the two things that you're analogizing are not alike, right? A, a car, right, is not like the Grand Canyon. So to say, well, a car, look, it's complicated, and it fits all together, and we know that somebody designs the car. Look at the Grand Canyon, everything flows together, the water goes down there, not flowing up, et cetera, et cetera. So it also must be designed. So, he, I mean, he showed the reason why it's flawed. That's number one. So, as, so it, all, the, all that the intelligent design is, it reduces to an argument, to the argument from design, the teleological argument, but just updated in terms of the information that they're looking at, okay? Um, that's number one. Okay. Um, and number two is they, um, they give as their examples, they give as their examples of the flaw in evolution a number of things, including some very, very specific scientific issues, which they say cannot be explained in any other way than by an intelligent designer. So they have created what they call um, instances of irreducible complexity. They look at certain biological phenomenon. And they say, like a complex bio biochemical pathway. And the biochemical pathway works when all the different pieces are there. Then, in the end, you get out what you need, what the organism needs from this complex pathway. Well, they say, well, the pathway only makes sense if it's a complete pathway, right? It can't be a half a pathway. Half a pathway doesn't get you anywhere. So it cannot make sense. So there are certain things that are irreducibly complex. They must have all the components in place in order for it to work. And natural selection says, no, that's not the way things happen. Things are not planned for the future. Things have to work now. They can be expanded upon and grown upon, but you, they can't, you can't build something into a biological system because at some point in the future, it's going to become useful. Right, I say, so they invented this idea of irre, irreducible complexity. Now, since this, this, the, I, the argument for irreducible complexity was introduced in around 1995 or 1996, um, the busy little scientists got to work, and they have taken the prime examples that they use for irreducible complexity, and they have shown the flaw in the argument, because they have shown that these so-called irreducibly complex systems actually do function in parts. That this large complex system was built up of smaller parts, each of which had a function, and now it's been put together into one very large function. And they've done the, the, the hard, what I call the hard science to really show that. Now, of course, none of the people who argue of ir for irreducible complexity have been convinced by a single scientific experiment. Because you have to understand, that's not their agenda. They're not really looking to advance science. They're looking to advance their religious agenda. So none of them have changed their mind in spite of the overwhelming facts um, that have been marshaled. Now, very important event in this history did take place um, just a little over a year ago. Um, December, the end of December uh, 2005, okay. Um, it's known, uh, you probably read about it if you were reading the newspapers. Um, there's a town, Dover, Pennsylvania, Dover, Pennsylvania. Um, there was an argument among the, the school board, members of the school board, um, wanted to, to, were insisting upon writing intelligent design into the curriculum of the Dover schools. Um, there were some members of the board that objected to it. So it goes through the usual uh, procedures, you appeal to the courts, it goes from one court to another. So finally, a federal judge, it comes up to a federal judge, um, which it did last year. Now, so this is now, so now we're talking about in the year 2005. You remember the history that I told you. So creation science, they gave up. They couldn't call themselves creation scientists anymore. They changed the name to intelligent design, and they are mounting this new initiative. And it's going to come to court, and it's going to be tried in the federal courts. And the judge that pulls the, uh, uh, the slot who's going to do it is actually, his name is Johnny Jones III. 
Um, and this is going to be a royal showdown, you know, a la Scopes trial. They were going to bring their best witnesses from all over the world to Dover, Pennsylvania. The scientists were bringing their best witnesses to Dover, Pennsylvania. And everything was going to be played out in the court of law. Um, and this objective judge was going to decide, is intelligent design part of science and therefore can be mandated into the curriculum or not? Now, they were very, very happy in drawing um, Judge Jones because Judge Jones was a Georgia W. Bush appointee. He's a political conservative, a religious man on his own. The, I know people that were very closely involved in the trial, that gave testimony at the trial. Um, the intelligent design advocates were convinced that they were going to win. Um, the trial lasted several weeks. The judge did his homework. Um, he had read all that he was supposed to have read in advance. Um, he asked very, very good questions of the people who were presenting intelligence design. He also had a number of scientists, including a colleague of mine, Ken Miller from Brown University, who's very articulate and has been arguing this case for years to show the flaws in intelligent design. Um, and lo and behold, it's known as the Kitzmiller decision. So in December something, December 20 something, 2005, he came up with the Kitzmiller decision. Um, in which a federal judge ruled on Tuesday that it was unconstitutional for a Pennsylvania school district to present intelligent design as an alternative to evolution in high school biology courses because it's a religious viewpoint that advances a particular version of Christianity. And this was the nation's first case to test this intelligent design. Um, what he actually did is he took some of the tracts, you know, some of the, 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 the pamphlets and books that they put out arguing for intelligent design, right? And he actually showed that these were the very same books that had been written 15 years earlier to advance creation science. And all they did is they just crossed out creation science and they wrote in intelligent design. Um, so the judge was very, very tough on them because he felt that they were not being honest. Um, and, uh, and he felt, anyway, that's, that was the decision. So this Kitzmiller decision is very, very important. So the United States federal courts have ruled as, an unco as unconstitutional public school district requirement endorsing intelligent design as an alternative to evolution in science classes on the grounds that its inclusion violates the establishment clause of the First Amendment. Kitzmiller versus Dover Area School District, 2005, Johnny jo uh, John Jones III ruled that intelligent design is not science and is essentially religious in nature. So do we learn anything from the Dover trial? Absolutely, because every argument that they trotted out was exposed in an open court of law, objected by a judge who was not a secularist, who was not a materialist scientist, but is actually somebody who was a religious person. Specifically ruled at the trial that their, their examples of irreducible complexity, the bacterial flagellum, the blood clotting system, et cetera, et cetera, or the generation of biologic information, that those are all answered by standard, bio, standard um, biological scientific explanations. So kind of in celebration, I guess, of, um, of that victory, Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You shouldn't believe in evolution. Wait, 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 wait. You shouldn't believe in evolution. You believe in God. You know, evolution is a, theory, is a scientific theory. You could, you could think it's a correct theory. You think it's a theory that has evidence, but it's not believing. Right. Yeah. 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 Right. 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 Correct. Good. That's the second half of the lecture. Second half of the lecture. I promise to get there. Yes. Okay. So I'm fine. All right. So fine. So, so we're all okay. Okay. That's great. No, that's great. I understand. So we're all okay on this. All right. And uh, like I said, I didn't know who's going to be there. So Science, Mag Science Magazine, the standard journal of American science. Uh, last year, they make evolution in action, the breakthrough of the year. Of course, they point out that the real breakthrough was was this great scientist Darwin, who came up with the theory in the first place. But 150, year, 150 years later, we have 150 years more evidence that shows what a brilliant theory this idea of evolution and natural selection was. And so they have all of the actual recent discoveries, all of which are explainable by evolution through natural selection, not explainable by any alternative theory. Okay, so that's the world of science, and I put this man up here because he's been uh, crucified in so many ways. This is Charles Darwin, young Charles Darwin. Um, even during his uh, lifetime, he was not always you know, related to monkeys. People saw him as the monkey person, right? related to apes, unsympathetically. This is one of the last pictures ever taking him. Uh, you see he looks much more somber 
he was. He had a very difficult life, but he's a great scientist, a great hero, one of the greatest uh, scientists of the 19th century, and probably one of the greatest scientists um, since the Enlightenment. Um, but again, that's a t subject of another lecture. I could tell you why I think he was a great scientist, but that's, uh, all right. So the question is, this, uh, you know, Darwin at the turning point. Obviously, what he was saying was controversial, and he knew it, and in 1859, when he published the origin of species, he knew that it was controversial, um, what he was saying. Um, did he worry that it would be a lot less trouble to go along with creationism? Maybe he did. You know, one of the great enigmas of intellectual history is that Darwin made his famous trip on the, on the Beagle around the world multiple times between 1831 and 1836. He comes back with all of this information. He keeps Im immaculate journals. Um, daily journals as well as scientific notebooks of the work that he's doing and we know that by 1838 he has the theory of evolution worked out. The Origin of Species is not published until 1859. And during that time he did a lot of work trying to fill in more of the scientific information but why in the world did it take him 20 years to publish the theory? Okay, so that's one of the great intel... I, I, I think I know the answer. The answer is that he, his wife was very conventionally religious. He came from an upper class English family. He didn't want to rock the boat. He was not this crusader that was out to raise issues about religion. And he realized that his theory did that. And I think he was very hesitant to publish it. That's my theory, okay? There you go. Now, okay, so now we're gonna to get to these kinds of questions. So why is it, you know, why is it a debate in the United States? You know, is it that you really have a few, you know, fundamentalist Christians out there and they're pushing this whole debate and the rest of us are kind of there floating along? Well, the answer is, and, and, and the debate is all about evolution, what gets taught in the biology class? I mean, who cares about biology? You know, so you take it in ninth grade, you never have to take it again if you don't want to. Is that so important in the world? Well, I think it is, but, but you know, but I, I, I understand that a lot of people would argue, no, it's not really that important. Um, so you have to understand. So what, what's, what's being debated here is a lifestyle, a fundamental lifestyle, right? It's a question of values. It's a question of how you look at human life. Do you look at human life as being something that's special, unique, spiritually endowed, where God reached down from heaven and gave life to Adam, as Michelangelo portrayed it? Or do you see human life as just being part of this chemical continuum with molecules bouncing around blindly in the universe, bumping into each other, forming more complex molecules, you know, and eventually kind of just coming up with something that's called human beings, right? That's the debate, right? Whose side are you on? Spiritual values? Secular values? Now a word from my sponsor. Okay, so I teach at Yeshiva University, and we're not the only university that does that, but yes, they have been um, employing me for a long time, but, but more deeply. Um, so here's a university that says that, uh, there's our motto, this is our old motto, it says so right there, right? That's the question, right? How do you deal with Torah and Mada at the same time? How do you reconcile these two apparently irreconcilable opposites? Um, so supposedly that's what we're supposed to know what we had to do these things. Okay, so um, this I just put up to show you that evolution is not a static science. It's not like all the work on evolution that has ever been done um, has already been done. It's an active field of research. As a word, as things keep coming up. This was something that just came out last April, 2006. Another chain in the link between fishes and terrestrial animals. This uh, Tiktaalik uh, fossil was discovered, as have been literally tens of thousands of other link, you know, what, what was supposedly, you know, these, the, these, these missing link follicles, uh, f fossils that, that occur. Um, again, part of the dogma of anti-evolution is, well, there are all these missing links, you know. I don't know that there are all these missing links. I, you know, I go to the paleological museums and I see the missing links are all there. But they keep saying there are missing links, there are missing links, there are missing links, and people out there that don't do the research on their own say, oh yeah, there must be missing links. But anyway, a lot of these links are being filled in, as well as really a deepening of the understanding of the molecular evolution. Molecular evolution, because now we can look not only at the outward form of organisms, but we look at the molecules that make them up, including, and most especially, their genomes. So everybody knows about the Human Genome Project, um, but there, what we are doing now is we're looking at the genomes of 
as many animals as we can as fast as we can. And these are direct empirical evidence that show us the relationships between different lineages. So we, we are checking our phylogenies and making corrections and building new phylogenies based on, 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 on standard hardcore science. Um, most of which, as I said, is, best, is, is only explained by um, evolution through natural selection. So the way I presented it to you, right, um, creation science, intelligent design, um, primarily a fundamentalist Christian movement, right? Why is it a fundamentalist Christian movement? Because if you're locked into a literal reading of Genesis 1, if you read that as being literal and being the word of God, then you have no choice but to reject cosmology and evolution. I agree. Okay? Um, by the way, just for the record and for whatever it's worth, the mainstream Protestant churches, as well as the mainstream Catholic thought, right, is not creationist nor intelligent designist, for what it's worth. But it is a phenomenon of American fundamentalist Protestantism. Okay, is it a Jewish controversy? So I have to tell you that until fairly recently, uh, my answer was, it's really not our problem, and I'll tell you why it's not our controversy in particular. I have to get to that. But there's the but, right? And the but is, I don't know, again, how many of you saw, but two years ago, there was this, uh, what I call the, the Slifkin affair. Anybody read about that? The zoo rabbi, the Slifkin affair? Good, just as well that you didn't. But it was in the papers, and since it was in the papers, um, I have to, um, although I usually don't talk about this because it's largely an embarrassment, but, um, but it's there, and, um, and honesty, intellectual honesty, um, means that I have to present this to you. So in point of fact, um, two years ago, um, you see the Gedole Yisrael, the great uh, rabbis in both in, in Israel and in um, and in the United States, came out with a ban on a set of books that were written by this young scholar called Nassan Slifkin. Um, and the ban on the book, the literal, a, a, a literal you know, ban, put him in cherem, right? Uh, also known as the Zoo Rabbi, the science of Torah, mysterious creatures, filled with heretical ideas on the fundamentals of Amuna, a faith formed by a former yeshiva student himself. So um, Nassan Slifkin um, is a really a, a charming young man who uh, became very, very interested in biology. He did grow up in the yeshiva world, actually in the, more in the modern orthodox world, but then moved into the, what I call the right-wing world, the Haredi world, uh, and continued his interest in studying animals. And then he wrote a series of books about um, biology and about science as it relates to Talmudic topics. Um, innocent enough, unless you're dealing with the Haredi world. Because in the Haredi world, any mention of science, any mention of anything that doesn't conform to their understanding of, uh, of the Torah is something that has to be banned. So um, these bans came out. That's Rabbi Slifkin over there. Uh, he writes these books, Man and Beast, uh, Our Relationship with Animals in Jewish, in Jewish Law and Thought. You would think these things are you know, kind of non-controversial. The Challenge of Creation, Judaism Encounter with Science, Cosmology and Evolution, Rabbi Natan Slifkin. But these are the bands that they put up in Israel and in Hebrew and in America and English, literally putting his books in Cherem. Um, it's there. So um, I have to tell you that fundamentalism right, is not limited to Christianity. That lo and behold, at the end of the 20th century, um, we find something called Jewish fundamentalism. Now, I have to tell you that it's a new find. It's a new find because we Jews, and I'm talking about the most traditional Jews, right, have not been fundamentalists for as long as there has been rabbinic commentary on the Torah which in essence we say goes back to Mount Sinai. As soon as the Torah was given, it was given we began analyzing and thinking about it and, uh, and talking about it. And that's why the title of my talk was called Darwin and Drash. Drash, somebody asked me what it is. That's the, the, the Hebrew term for midrash, for understanding how we understand verses in the Torah, sometimes in a non-literal way. Um, so um, there is a history, as I said, going from classic Talmudic literature through the modern age, and which is very clear that um, most Jewish thinkers were not looking at Beratius 1, Genesis 1, as a literal story. 
right? So this, uh, this so I throw these Jewish creationists in just so that if anybody says, how come you never, how come you didn't say that they were there? Well, I did. They were there. Are they relevant? Largely not relevant. What I really like to talk about then is what's relevant to Judaism, to Jewish tradition, to Jewish thought. Um, and so um, expanding on, uh, I mentioned before, there's a little man sitting in the front who's selling a book. It's called Jewish Tradition and Darwinism. So there is an article that I wrote in here on Rabbi Soloveitchik's thought and his approach to evolution. Um, I wrote this in, again, after teaching this and, and learning with him for many years and teaching this stuff for you know, 20 years, 25 years, I wrote down his, his approach to evolution, which, we call a, which I call a misnagdic approach, coming from a different way. And I counterbalanced that with Rabbi Cook, with Rav Cook in Israel, who has a Hasidic approach. So I talked about how both of them in their own ways, uh, were able to deal with evolution. Um, at, at, the, at the time that I gave that talk, um, there was nothing other than that one comment that I put up on the board in the beginning. There was nothing that Rabbi Soloveitchik had ever written explicitly about evolution. Um, but he said a lot of other things about science that I was able to write about, plus, as I said, I have had conversations with him. So I know that what, everything that I wrote in here is true, and I still stand by it. However, in the last few years, um, Rabbi Soloveitchik, again, anybody know anything about him? As I said, he's this iconic figure of modern centrist orthodoxy, uh, undoubtedly the, um, uh, the, the, the most important Jewish thinker of the, 20, of the 20th century. Um, so, um, but he, he, he didn't publish a lot in his lifetime. He just didn't publish. But he wrote a lot, but he just never published it. In the last few years, scholars have had access to his writings, and they have been editing and publishing his writings. So that's a great boon. So in 2005, long after the material for my chapter was written, so a book came out. I think I have it up here so you can see it. Yeah, it's called The Emergence of Ethical Man by Rabbi Joseph B. Soloveitchik. It was based on manuscripts that he wrote largely in the 1940s, 1950s, um, edited by Michael Berger, a Jewish scholar at uh, Duke University, or University of North Carolina, I think, um, from this, what's called the Torah's Harah Foundation, 2005, put out by Katav. Um, it's a remarkable book. If you're gonna buy a book, that's the book to buy. Forget about the other book uh, with my chapter in it. Read this book. Um, it's a, um, a very important book, and it has more about more relevance to evolution and to the Rubs thinking, but it's in black and white. So before I could say, well, I know what the Rubs thinking was because I spoke to him. And everybody says, yeah, but I spoke to him, and he told me the exact opposite of what you're saying. But now it's in black and white. So um, I wanted to incorporate some of this material into tonight's lecture and, again, just make the, the, uh, the populace aware that, that this is this in writing. Um, so the Rub writes very, very beautifully, and I'm just going to give you a little bit of a... Um, of a foretaste kind of from his introductions, from his early, very early chapters, not go through the details of the book, obviously. The um, book only runs about 200 pages, so it's something that you can all read. Um, and the Rub starts off by uh, saying, should we inquire of a modern historian of philosophy or of any educated person well acquainted with the history of ideas, what he understands by the word man, he would immediately advise us about a basic controversy concerning the destiny or essence of this being that controversy that I talked about before. What does it really mean to be human? By the sheer force of associative thinking, we would at once refer to three disparate anthropological philosophical view, sorry, philosophical viewpoints. The biblical, referred to by many as the Judeo-Christian view, the classical Greek, and the modern empirico-scientific. Press further, he'd probably say that the discrepancy between the concepts of man dating back to antiquity, the biblical, and the classical Greek is by far not as wide as the gap separating those two from the empirico scientific, the modern scientific view of human beings. As a matter of fact, he would say, we may speak to some degree of affinity, of commensurability between the biblical and classical anthropologies. Both are united in opposition to the scientific approach to man. They set man apart from other forms of organic life. Traditionally, the biblical point of view says that man as a spiritual being is different and unique from the rest of the living world. Um, the Greeks agreed, Greek philosophy agreed that man was unique in this world. In the Greek world, as the Rav goes on to explain, um, the Greek world said that man was different in intellect. And the biblical world said man was different spiritually. But they both agreed that man was different. Right? Animals are one thing, human being is something else. Okay. 
In contradistinction, the modern scientific viewpoint spurns the idea of human autonomy as mythical, unfounded, denies the ontic discrepancy between man and the animal world. The unity and continuity of organic life is looked upon as an indispensable postulate of all chemical sciences. Man, animal, and plant are all placed in the realm of matter, organized in living structures and patterns. The differences between the vegetative animal and the human life concern just the degree of diversity, complexity, and organization of life processes. Life is such as a common grant from nature to all three forms of organic matter, and they share it alike. That's the scientific point of view, as opposed to the classical Greek philosophical or the biblical Judeo-Christian view. Okay. Um. He says, and the ramifications of, the contro of that controversy, what, you know, who cares? The answer is that it makes a difference, right? They extend into all areas of human philosophical thought. One's theoretical worldview, as well as one's practical creed, are deeply affected by one's anthropological philosophy. That's why that slide that I showed you with Michelangelo and the atomic theory makes a difference, because he's saying it does make a difference on how you view human beings. All right, because how you live and the values that you live, every axiological system presupposes an understanding of the nature of man. And of course, the schism between the biblical classical and the empirical doctrine is of paramount importance to our moral and ethical code, where the man is a transcendental, above nature in some way, or a natural being is quite essential to our axiological experience. I wish to emphasize that the widespread opinion that within the perspective of anthropological naturalism, there is no place for the religious act for the relatedness of man to eternity or infinity is wrong. So he's disputing what he would call conventional wisdom. Here's something. It's certain that the fathers of the church and also the Jewish medieval scholars, and that by that he means most of the medieval Jewish philosophers, including Maimonides, including Rambam, including the Ralbag, etc., etc., and even modern Jewish moralists have almost can canonized this viewpoint and attributed it to it apodictic validity, meaning it's unquestionably true that the biblical view of man is that man is totally different in nature and in kind from the rest of the animal world. Yet, the consensus of many, however great and distinguished, does not prove the truth or falseness of a particular belief. I have always felt that due to some erroneous conception, we have actually misunderstood the Judaic anthropology and read into the biblical text ideas which stem from an alien source. This feeling becomes more pronounced when we try to read the Bible, not as an isolated literary text, but as a manifestation of a grand tradition rooted in the very essence of our God consciousness that transcends the bounds of the standardized and fixed text and fans out into every aspect of our existential experience. The sooner biblical texts are placed in their proper setting, namely the oral tradition with its almost endless religious awareness, the clearer and more certain I am that Judaism does not accent unreservedly the theory of man's isolation and, separate, and separatism within the natural order of things. He then proceeds to say, to distinguish between the Christian view and the Jewish view, and he says that and I won't go into this particularly, that the Christians needed this for the essence of their theology, but that was not the case in Judaism. Um, at any rate, both ideas were considered inseparable by the Bible. Christianity succeeded in isolating them, that's man's separateness, and reducing the element of naturalness to a state of corruption and encountering the transcendent being with an alternative, death or life, while death means transcendental forms of existence. Um, the Christian theologians never tried to reconstruct the story of creation of man out of the wholeness of creation. Whenever they read the story, they instinctively, instinctually clung to the verse, let us make mankind in our image, meaning God-like, and by doing so, they established his supernatural character, his interaction with the transcendental world. They did not dare to tell the story of man in the aboriginal terms of Genesis. Let us analyze this. That's his introduction. He then goes through a very careful, almost line by line reading of the book of Genesis and the beginning of the book of Shemos with his understanding, his understanding of what happened, of what the Bible tells us happened to human beings from the time that they were placed in the Garden of Eden till the time that they received the Torah at Mount Sinai. And he traces this through a series of developments, emergences, Right, that took place in human consciousness along the way. These emergences are natural events. Human awareness increases, human knowledge increases, people change, special charismatic individuals come along and change the way we think about ourselves. 
Um, and so he goes through seven major changes that take place. Um, again, I'll leave this for you to read in the book. Um, the remarkable thing about this is that this is a book of, by the Rubb's definition, of Soloveitchik's definition, of natural anthropology. It doesn't require supernatural intervention at any point along the way. Man's emergence as an ethical individual, ethical spiritual individual, is a natural process. You want to know how he deals with it? That's why the book is there. Go and buy the book. Okay? So, um, the book was called, and I'm not sure whether he titled it or Michael Berger, who was working on it, gave it the title, The Emergence of Ethical Man. But in point of fact, this book could have been called The Evolution of Ethical Man. I guess evolution would have been a little hotter uh, topic, and nobody wanted to do that. Yes? No, it's in English. It's in English, yes. Yeah, so, so, okay, so that's, so that's the last part of my talk. I, yes, so um, clearly he does not read the Bible in a literal way, okay? So that's why I put up here that, without going through all of it, but just whetting your appetite, his reading, like everything that Soloveitchik did, it's radical. Nobody writes like him, nobody thought like him, nobody talks like him. But on the other hand, it's a very, very traditional way of looking at the Bible. Not the specifics, but the way of looking at the Bible is very, very traditional. So when you read it, you will see it's a rabbinic text, right? Some new ideas, some new ways of looking at things, but nothing out of the mainstream of the way that Jews have been reading these texts from ad infinitum, from the time that the text was given. So we're running out of time, and so I'm not going to spend time on this, and maybe I should have short-circuited some of the material in the beginning, but again, I wasn't sure what it was that your interests were. But let me just at least tell you that if you look at the biblical text, here are the first five verses um, in Hebrew, here are the first five verses of the text in English. Well, uh, all right, let's just look at it once. I can't not teach this. Okay. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. Darkness was upon the deep, and the Spirit of God hovered on the face of the waters. God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good. God divided between the light and the dark. God called the light day and the darkness night, and there was evening and there was morning one day. That's the first day, the first five verses. Okay, what's the very first thing that God creates? Everybody agree? He creates the heavens and the earth first. What's the very first thing that God creates? Well, okay, so I ask this of every audience, and a lot of people say the heaven and the earth, but then a lot of people say, no, the very first thing he created on the first day was light. Okay. Um, so who's right? Should we take a vote? Who's right? Who's wrong? What's the answer? Depends on, that's, that, it's, it's ambiguous. It's ambiguous. All right. Did we just discover this ambiguity right here now? No, of course not. Did every Jewish thinker who looked at this realize that it was ambiguous? Yes. Did, different, did every single Mifaresh who, from, Rosh, from, from the rabbis of the Talmud through Rashi and his contemporaries and, 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 uh, and, and, and students deal with this? They absolutely did. So if you want to understand, is it straightforward? Is there a literal way of reading this? Well, the answer is there are many literal ways of reading this, but they're not literal anymore, right? There are different ways of interpreting this. Okay, so at the very beginning, you know, Rashi, the classical com commentator, no, that's not really a picture of him, but you know, I, I pulled that off. Anyway, um, it, read Rashi. Rashi's available in Hebrew, Rashi's available in English nowadays, there's no problem. You see, Rashi, Rashi recognized it as being a problem. Did he create the heaven and the earth first, or did he create light first? And the first thing that it says is, God said, let there be light. On the other hand, the first two verses already speak of heavens and earth and darknesses and void. So Rashi has his way of darshaning it, right? And he says the first two psukim are introductory psukim. In the beginning of God's creation of heaven and earth, etc., 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 then he created light. That's Rashi's way of reading it. Okay. Is that the only way to read it? So anybody knows anything about medieval biblical exegesis, that's such a fancy word. Anybody who knows, right, who, um, so classically every Jewish person, 
unfortunately, it was probably every Jewish male. But okay, every Jewish person who was given education, so the first thing you do is you learn Chumash, and you learn Chumash along with Rashi. You don't learn Chumash without Rashi. If you got anything above a very elementary school ed education, literally the first few grades, you read other Mifarshim. And the other parish, that's the standard rabbinic text, the most common one that's used as second to Rashi, is this, Rabbi Moshe ben, Na ben uh, Nachman. Right? Right? Not Rambam, but Nachmanides. Okay, standard text. It disagrees entirely with Rashi. Respectfully, quotes Rashi, tells you how Rashi got to be where he was. Has an entirely different reading of the text. It's available in Hebrew. It's available in Rabbi Chevelle's um, edited edition. Um, and now here the clear and correct meaning of these, and he disagrees on linguistic terms. This I have in my chapter, if you're interested, you could read it. He disagrees on linguistic terms. He also disagrees because he has a slightly different hashkafa than Rashi did. He has a slightly different way of looking at these things, including a Kabbalistic bent that Rashi didn't have. Anyway, um, and now here the clear and correct meaning of the verses. The Holy One, blessed be He, created all things from absolute nothingness. In Hebrew language, the only verb that can describe this Ex nihilo creation is bara. Not everything which is now seen below or above the heavenly sphere was created directly from this absolute nothingness. Rather, God drew out of this complete and absolute nothingness a very thin primordial material without any real substance to it, but that had the ability in the future, right, or the power to become actualized and to attain shape or substance and to move from the potential to the actual. And this first primordial matter is what the Greek philosophers call hylum. This is all in the Ramban. After this creative act, God did not create anything in the sense of bara. The rest of creation described in the chapter uses terms such as made, formed, etc., etc., because all, all this was drawing out and giving form to what was there earlier in the primordial material. So if so, the correct meaning of this text is that first God created shamayim, for it was created from nothingness, and aretz, but they don't mean ar shamayim and ar aretz. These are the primordial terms for matter and energy. That's what the Ramban says. Um, which also created from nothingness, and this arets included the four basic elements in this creation, which began as a small fine point, big bang, I don't know, was included, and that will eventually become the heavens and the earth. This is just the language of the Ramban, okay? Nachman, Genesis 1-1. In its in-depth meaning, the term day refers not to a period of time, but to the divine emanations that are called spherot. For each creative act of God in which more of the divine is revealed to the world is called a day. And the explanation of all this is very deep and profound, and our ability to explicate this is less than a drop in the entire Torah. Okay, so this is the Ramban. This is not a radical, this is not a scientist in the 20th century trying to rationalize away a biblical text that gives him trouble. This is a standard rabbinic Mefaresh, standing in normative Judaism. If anything, Ramban is viewed as being the defender of tradition over Rashi, who was a little bit, you know, loose in, in, in following the parish rather than what others had said before him. The Ramban comes to defend tradition. So this is as normative, as traditional as you can get, and yet you see what he's saying is the sequence of six days of creation, it's not a crime. First of all, they're not days. The days are not days. The days are spherot. I know, if you want, hang around later, I'll tell you what spherot are, at least my understanding of them. But anyway, they're not days, and they're not chronological. But it describes different levels of divine revelation that Kabbalists call the spherot. Okay, so if you're Jewish and you're raised, right, reading Rashi and the Ramban, right, and you have to then think about questions of deep time and deep space and ancient histories and things like that, are you troubled by a literal reading of Genesis 1 or what we would call Bereshis 1? Of course not. That's what we've been doing. Now, lest you think that this Ramban, if you don't know him and you think that I just pulled him out as, you know, he's really a pseudo -sci cryptic scientist sitting in there trying to, you know, divert uh, religious people from the, he didn't make this up. He didn't create of this. He's working in a normative tradition that goes back to the Midrash. So here I just say, I, I emphasize, Nachmani's commentary on the Torah has always been seen as coming immediately after that of Rashi in terms of importance and popularity. Therefore, any student who progressed beyond the most rudimentary traditional Jewish education would have read the Ramban. Furthermore, Ramban is seen as being far more conservative commentary than Rashi, precisely because he always tries to explain the text in conformity with rabbinic dicta. In presenting this very non-literal translation of Genesis, Ramban is seeking to remain within the common rabbinic tradition as found in the standard Midrashic sources of which I will just mention two of them, okay? Time is running out. I'm not going to go through the Midrashic sources. But again, Ramban didn't make this up. The reason that he's writing this is because, uh, because of Midrash, going back to Talmudic 
scholars, Tanaitic and Amoraic scholars. Rabbi Yehuda ben Simon says it does not say there was evening, Yehi Erev, but Vay Yehi Erev, and there was evening. That's after the first day. And there was evening. Why do you need that extra and in there? This teaches us that there were time sequences prior to the one being described. Rabbi Abahu says from this we learn that God created worlds and destroyed them, created, destroyed them, saying, this one pleases me, this one does not please me. All right, that's uh, that, that you can give, uh, give you a whole lecture on, on, on that one, because that's a Right, that's a that, that's a that's a, a conversation stopper. God created worlds, and then he sees it doesn't please him. Doesn't God know everything that he's going to create before he creates it? Anyway, different, different. That's a different shear. I have a shear on that. Yeah, another one. And there was evening, and there was morning. The sixth day. Everything else, there was no the. It was Yom Echad, Yom Sheni, etc. But Yom HaShishi, Rabbi Shem of Amartya said the sixth day, the end of creation. Rabbi Shem of Amartya says, until now, the end of the sixth day, the counting was according to a universal time. Minyan Olam is the word he uses. And from here onwards, it's a different time scale. Okay, so is it some apologetic scientist in the 20th century or 21st century who has to say that we never read this literally in terms of a six-day type of creation, that we're not fundamentalists, and that is not radical, but that's part and parcel of our tradition. Of under, that's what, the way we've been reading the, we, we've been reading the Bible um, all these many, many years. So, if Rabbi Soloveitchik has his way of looking at it, and as I point out in the article, uh, Rav Cook has his way of looking at it, again, these were not, they were radical in that they wrote in a different language, but they're not radical in what they're saying, because what they're saying is part of normative Judaism. You know what's radical? To say that we're fundamentalists. You know who's radical? Those Haredim that I pointed to before who said, oh my God, if you say the universe is millions of years old, it's heresy, it contradicts the Bible. That's radical. You don't find that in Jewish thought until just now. And I have to say that it's a, I mean, I have to see it as a reaction to, you have to be as from as the Christians. If the Christians are rejecting it, if the Christian fundamentalists are rejecting it, we can't be less from than they are, because it makes no sense to me. You, there, there no, there's no, just no precedence for it in Jewish learning. Um, so... In light of these texts, the scientific findings of the 19th and 20th centuries that point to the long, slowly developing history, both the cosmos and the biological worlds, do not present problems for Jewish thinkers. And it wasn't just the Rav, and it wasn't just Rav Cook. This is Rav Yisrael Lifshitz, lived, you can see, 1782 to 1861. I'll, I'll get to you in one, in one minute. Um, he's a very, very famous rabbinic scholar. He's known as the Teferis Yisrael. He wrote a parish on the Mishnah you know, the, the uh, Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi's formulation of rabbinic law, right? It's published in every single edition of the Mishnah. Every single rabbinic edition of the Mishnah has his commentary on it. In the year 1841, he has a sermon that he gave. It's, that then, he, then he wrote it up as a pamphlet um, to his congregation, right? It's the most important rabbinic text on evolution, <laughs> believe it or not. Published 29 years before Darwin wrote The Origin of Species. So it's not apologetic. It's not a response to popularity of Darwinism. It's the most important rabbinic text on evolution, and it's sitting there, and it's in every rabbinic edition of the Mishnah in every base medrash in the world, except nobody bothers to read it. Um, Rev. Hirsch dealt with it, you know, the great leader of uh, Torim Derech Eretz, Rev. Cook, I said, in the 20th century. But my point, my final point is that the non-literal reading, the deep and profound reading of Sefer Voracious, that's something that we Jews have been doing since God gave us the Torah and gave us the ability to sit and analyze it. Um, I, you know, I'll, I'll end with this. Um, when I was a lot younger, and the Rov was my, my, my Rebbe, and I was learning biology, I, I, I'll, be a little, all right, I'll be a little biographical. Okay, so I was a science nut since I was a little kid. Right? That means that the first Afikoman present that I ever asked for was a chemistry set, and then in the year after that I asked for a microscope. So I was just a scientific nut. But I also grew up in a house where Jewish learning was, was, um, was part and parcel of, of what we did. I learned how to read Aleph Bass as soon as I learned how to read English. Um, I learned um, Chumash the same times I was reading Dick and Jane. Okay, um, and, and the world of learning was part of my life, as, as was the world of science, because I just had this natural you know, curiosity bent. It, just, it made sense to me. It fascinated me. Right, um, that was the the life that I lived. Okay, I became a professional scientist. I also, you know, got smicha along the way. I teach Gemara, you know, in various different places. I do science, as I as I, as I said at the beginning. Um, the truth of the matter is, I have to tell you, it never occurred to me that there was a conflict until I was an adult. And people from the outside said, "Well, how do you deal with the conflict between you know science and religion?" To which I used to say, "What conflict are you talking about? You know, please explain to me what the conflict is." 
uh, and that's only tongue in cheek. I have to also tell you, at a certain point when I was um, in college, or actually I had graduated from college in the Rav Shear, and at one point I was with the Rav at a place where, you know, I thought we could talk in private. So I said something to Rabbi Soloveitchik about, you know, you know, a lot of people are concerned about the um, conflict of science and the problem of, of science and religion. And he turned to me, he said, what problem are you talking about? So I said, well, you know, evolution. And he says, there are no problems. And he didn't want to discuss any further. It wasn't necessary. It was, there, was, there were no issues. But I think you understand why there were no issues to any normative Jewish thinker you know, raised and brought up in Jewish tradition with Medrash and Gemara and Rashi and the Ramban and all of the other Meforshim, um, these are simple issues to deal with. Um, all right, so I see the time is late, and I do want to answer some questions and leave some time for discussion, so I'll stop here and take some questions. Yes? Okay. Okay. Well, the interventions, remember, the, the, the Bible is written from the human perspective, not from the divine perspective. So the interventions are the perceptions and awareness of human beings of the God who stands behind the material world that we actually see. And that's the nature of the Bible. And each one, each one of the prophets, or each one of those who are writing those books, had a different way of, of, of or perceiving him. And that's part of our tradition. So, as the Rav pointed out in the very beginning, as I'm going to, the part that I gave you to whet your appetite. But I, I, you know, I encourage you to go read the book. Obviously, he says everything much, much better than I would, would ever say it, let alone in the time that we have. Um, but um, the point is that um, it's precisely because we live in the world where we don't see God that the search for God becomes that much more important. That the digging for God and that, and that divine emptiness when we don't see him is even stronger precisely because we don't live in a spiritual world. We live in a material world and we are material beings. And so that's why it's more crucial for him to say, I have to explain to you how a material being in a material world can still have a relationship with the divine. That's what's in that book. And I won't try to teach it. I'll regalachas. Yes. Yes. But not to the exclusion of biology. In, the, in letters that he wrote, he says that he certainly includes biology, but, but his book, Rav Cook's point, and again, you have to get them to invite me back for a different talk, because the, Rav Cook had a whole different approach. The Rav was a misnagid, and, and Rav Cook was a chassid and a, and a mekubal. Okay, so his approach was very different. He's coming from a different mindset, all right? But if you understand his approach, um, then what he said, and as he sees the world from a Kabbalistic point of view as evolving from tohu vavohu, from nothingness, to yumos hamashiach, right? It doesn't happen instantaneously. You, you don't get that way. It's a long process. Well, a process that changes along the way. Another word for a process that changes along the way is evolution. So he says, so yeah, so when the scientists are talking about evolution and cultural evolution, he says, we're all talking about the same thing. They're talking about in the secular, in the material world, what we are also saying is the fundamental spiritual evolution that's going on in the universe. I don't know what that question means. <laughs> I don't know what that question means. I don't know what stamp of approval. He, I understand, look, I understand there are a lot of people nowadays who don't want Rav Cook to have put a stamp of approval on evolution. So I say, well, you can't really find anywhere where he gave his gushpanka, his little seal, you know, the kafke, the OU. Yes, evolution is a good idea. First of all, he's writing about evolution in 1930. Evolution in 1930 is not, is not evolution of, of, of 2002, which I have to say is his approach, right? This, okay? So I don't know what it means. Would he have approved of evolution? I don't know. He doesn't know evolution. He didn't read, he's not reading my biology textbooks now. He had a certain concept of evolution. And the concept of evolution, as he understood it in 1930, and by the way, it was quite different from the way it was today. There were progressivists, I mean, scientists who did evolution, who saw a progress in evolution that a lot of scientists don't see today. To that part of biology, 100%, I, was, I say he signed on. Would he have signed on today? That's, you know, if I had a sister, would you like chulant? I, you know, I don't know the answer to that. You can't answer what he would have, you know. You can't climb into anybody else's head. Yes. Hmm. 
were you asleep during the last 20 minutes? We, we don't. No, it's not literal. It's neither chronological nor literal. You have to have a place to start. It was gen- let, let me ask you something else. Let, let me ask you something else. You know, every every ca- every every calendar has to you know has to start somewhere. The idea that we celebrate 5767 Libriasa Olam it's medieval. In, in Talmudic times, the, the, the Talmudic sages kept the Euclidean calendar. In medieval times, they didn't want to keep the Christian calendar because precisely because it's based on the birth of their redeemer. So they needed something else. So they calculated backwards in a literal way to the beginning, and that's how they came up with the Minyano Shalolam. Is that an eker of Judaism that we really believe literally the world was created 5,767 years ago? The answer is no. Yes. Hmm. Mm-hmm. No, the search, the search, right, the search is initiated by humans, just like our search for an understanding of the material universe that we live in, it's initiated by human beings. But the Rabbi Soloveitchik would say, and again, you know, just uh, I don't want to put words in anybody else's mouth, um, just like Rabbi Soloveitchik would say, there is a real material world out there, and if we explore it by the proper empirical methods, we will come to understand the scientific theories behind which it is built. There is a real God out there. And as we search for him in the right way, we will come to know him to the extent that human beings can in any way come to know something which is totally unknowable. All right? So the search comes from human beings. But he would not say that what we're generating is our own thoughts. All right, so um, once again, without being coy, um, the, the, the Rav has written on, on how we understand miracles and things like that. Um, and um, I don't want to, you know, again, standing on one, one, fit, one foot, try to encapsulate a rather um, complex philosophy. But certainly he would agree that what we call miracles are those moments in history when human beings realize and are able to see God's hand behind what is going on, which most of the time we don't see. But sometimes we do. And when we do, that's what we refer to as a miracle. Not that it is different metaphysically from the same event that occurred the day before. Is that abstruse? Yeah. In other words, the, the rub would say the, the, the rub would say the, the rub would say that there was nothing wrong with trying to look for the natural explanations. Let's say we're reading, you know, Parshas uh, Bo Shalach now of reading the, of trying to find a natural explanation for the ten plagues. Okay, there were locusts, there were winds, there were this. I mean, the Bible itself, right, gives it in very very physical terms. An east wind came and it blew the locust and it blew the waters. It doesn't say that they just happen. Right? The rabbi said there's nothing wrong with that. The miracle was that it happened at a time in Jewish history where that became very relevant because it was seen as God being angry at the Egyptians because of what they did to the Jews. And so those are true miracles. It, yes, because God's hand is in everything. To, to a, to, to, certainly to a Jewish person in the Jewish tradition, everything is God's hand. When the apple falls from the tree, right? Do I see Newton's formula or do I see God? What's the answer? Yes and yes. Yes and yes. God works through Newton's formulas for falling bodies. Right? That would be. So, so it's not like, and for the rub, it's not like you only see gods at those times. But those are the times when you're acutely aware of God's presence. Because there's the many times. I mean, he writes, if you've read, if you read his stuff, The Lonely Man of Faith. I mean, he certainly writes there are times when we need God and it's very hard to find him. God seems to be hiding his face from us. Right? And there are other times when God's face becomes a little more 
apparent to us, and usually it's in retrospect and things like that. As I said, it's a, he has a lot of different essays that deal with this in different ways, but certainly he says that it's not a metaphysical difference. It's not that this was a miracle, supernatural, and this is a natural event. He said it's all part of the natural world. Yes. The bottom line is it really doesn't matter what I think. It really, I'm a minor Jewish thinker in the grand scheme of things. I'm a teacher, okay? And all I could tell you is I could point you to the relevant texts. I could point you to what Rashi said. I could point you to what the Tiferes Yisrael said. It was very, very important. The Tiferes Yisrael, it's called the Drush or Hachayim. Yeah, here he is. Okay. That's, that's the Gedolim cards. So that's why I put him up there, because I want to make sure everybody understands that he's one of the Gedolim. Okay. The, um, he, wrote the, he wrote something called the Drush or Hachaim. It's found, you know, the Yakin and Boaz Mishnayis. Those are the big Mishnayis that you find in, in the base measures, all the Perushim. In the back of the Chelek on Sanhedrin, there's about a 30 or 40 page essay that he wrote, the Drush or Hachaim. It also has been translated into English by one of my colleagues, Yaakov Elman, published in one of Arya Kaplan's books. Arya Kaplan has a book on the ages of the universe or something like that, and the translation of the Drush or Hachayim is there. So if it, you read it either in Hebrew or in English, and you'll see he deals with that issue, what he calls a pre, pre-Adamic human beings. Were there pre-Adamic human beings? We would talk about, you know, was this Homo erectus or homo, early Homo sapiens, Chromo magnon. He deals with those issues, again, in the light of what we knew about uh, early humans in 1840, which is very different from what we know of now. But again, the derech is important, not necessarily specifically what he says. Yes. I think, that, I think that all religious thinkers um, would say that obviously there are certain profound things that we cannot understand about God, right? Because God is ultimately totally other and totally incomprehensible to human beings. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to understand the manifestations of God to the best way that we can, okay? So that's, so that's why we do, you know, theology. We think about God's... Uh, uh, what, what are God's midot and things like that. It's also the case that even in a very strictly technical halachic approach, the Rav said this many times, um, there's the area called tame hamitzvot, right? We do the Torah because we believe that God gave it to us, and I, we can't question. You can't, if God says to do something, he said, pick up a lulav, then we shake it. He said, of course. But at the very same time, all of Chazal spent their time trying to understand what it is, what's the symbolism, why do we do this, why this time of year, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the process of learning, right? The process of learning could never be a stamp of approval on what God wants us to do. I mean, if in the end I don't understand it, then I have to say, I don't understand it, that doesn't mean that I stop putting on tefillin. I mean, that's the way, that would be the approach of a, of a Norman. But on the other hand, the Rabbit said, but, but you don't have the right not to even think about it. So that would be to say that there are certain things that are better not asked. Again, it's a very, not just Rabbi Soloveitchik, but it's a very untraditional approach, right? What's my proof of that? What's my best proof of that? You study Gemara? Pick up a page of the Gemara. Is there a page in the Gemara? What's the Gemara built upon? Question, 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 answer. Question, question, question. Is there anything, did anybody ever say in the Gemara, don't ask that question? You're, uh, you're, you're an api, you, you know, you're, you're a chutzpah dick? Get out of my base, get out of my, base, uh, my yeshiva for teaching that question. Is you don't find that. You just don't find that. Questioning is good with the proviso that the question is not going to determine, as I said, when you, when you get up. And there are takeos too. Four. Sure. Absolutely. Yes. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Why don't you go first? We have... Absolutely. Absolutely. So two questions. One and two. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 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 Are there Jewish thinkers who think that? Undoubtedly. Um, uh, her question was basically that many Christian thinkers, and in fact many Jewish thinkers, would say, uh, by definition, a miracle is something that's supernatural. 
So in Jewish thought, do we have the idea that God could do anything, including things that are supernatural? So undoubtedly, there are many Jewish thinkers in the Middle Ages who define miracles in those terms. Rabbi Soloveitchik did not. Yes. Look, Mordecai Kaplan drew on many, um, many Jewish sources, and he's written so many things that for me to try to, in 30 seconds, tell you, you know, which are the Jewish sources that he drew upon and which are the ones that would stand in contradistinction to what he was saying, it just is a little too much to try to answer um, very briefly. Yes, one follow-up, and that's it. Yeah, so one of the... Well, I, I think the best answer that I could give you is that the, the Jewish traditions, that we call the oral law, right, is vast, complex, deep, profound, and at times contradictory. Um, it requires a lot of work to understand it. Um, the most authentic reading of it, that is the early Midrashic text, the early Tanaitic text, and the Gemara texts, are not written in a, in, in, a logical, in a logical conceptual format. They follow a free style thinking type of format. So it's very, very hard to find what you want where you want. In the Middle Ages, so Jewish scholars like Maimonides and others try to put them into a more into what we call an Aristotelian kind of logical way of looking at it. So you have you have Maimonides and you have Rev. Levi Ben Gershon, the Gersonides. Um, you have many medieval thinkers that tried to categorize the vast uh, the, the vast treasure of Jewish law and put it in terms of what are societal laws, what are human laws, which are religious laws, et cetera, et cetera. It was a great work of the middle 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 Ages. Thank you. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.